Welcome back, everyone. And I hope you enjoyed your short break to network, visit Engage Hub, and test your knowledge about UNA USA and the UN on Kahoot. Next, I'd like to introduce Peter Yeo, President of the Better World Campaign and Senior Vice President for United Nations Foundation. Peter joined UNF in 20, 2009 after more than 20 years in senior roles at the State Department and on Capitol Hill. Today, he will moderate the next discussion on the U.S. and the U.N. partnership. Peter, welcome. Well, thanks, Rachel. And I am just so pleased to be moderating this session. We have a great discussion planned on global affairs and the U.S.-U.N. partnership with two highly seasoned officials. We will be covering the topic of the day, Ukraine, as well as China and the Western Hemisphere and the U.S.-U.N. relationship. We recognize that we're hosting this event and this panel in the middle of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. I know that we're all deeply disturbed by the actions taken by the Russian government against Ukraine and its people and are hoping uh, that the world comes together to pressure Russia to return its soldiers to its borders. We only have 30 minutes. And so with that, I'd like to dive right in. Before I introduce our speakers, though, I do want to make a quick point about American attitudes towards foreign affairs. In general, on issues on foreign policy, there has been bipartisan agreement on the need for partners and global cooperation. And that's something that has been evident in polling that we have done for the past 20 years. In fact, last year we did our first state-by-state -state poll where we asked Americans, voters in all 50 states, about their perceptions of the relationship between the US and the UN. And this poll showed that regardless of where members of Congress, where they come from, whether they represent Alaska or Arkansas, that majorities of voters, Republican and Democrat, uh, felt that global cooperation serves US values and interests. And that global cooperation is greatly strengthened by active and sustained US leadership at the United Nations. Today, we're going to talk about leadership from the U.S. and at the U.N., and we have two great speakers to join us and guide us. We have Congressman French Hill, uh, who represents the Little Rock area in Arkansas. He is in his fourth term, and in 2021, Representative Hill was appointed as one of two congressional representatives to the United Nations General Assembly. In that role, the congressman demonstrated just the type of U.S. leadership in New York that we need. He has a long history of being involved in global affairs. Uh, the congressman served as a senior official in the administration of President George H.W. Bush. And after the fall of the Berlin Wall, he led the design of U.S. technical assistance to the emerging economies of Eastern and Central Europe uh, in the areas of banking and securities. The congressman has also been deeply interested in the Western Hemisphere during his time in Congress which, which meshes well with our other distinguished speaker, Ambassador Jeffrey De Laurentiis, who is currently the acting alternate representative for special political affairs at the U.S. Mission to the United Nations in New York. Ambassador De Laurentiis has been a career member of the Senior Foreign Service and has served in a variety of uh, key roles at the U.S. Mission and abroad, including as Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for the Bureau of Western Hemisphere Affairs, Director of Inter-American Affairs at the National Security Council and is a political counsel, counselor at the U.S. Embassy in Bogota. You have all their full bios, so I can stop right there and we're going to get into some questions. Um, uh, Ambassador De Laurentiis, if you don't mind, um, may I start with you on the topic of the day? Can you give us a sense about what's happening in New York um, uh, on Ukraine, on the Russian invasion? Has anything surprised you on how other member states have reacted, either in a Security Council or in the General Assembly? Um, tell us more. Uh, thanks, uh, Peter. Good to be um, with you. We we have kind of a, a fast-moving day here. Um, uh, President Biden just finished speaking uh, uh, to the nation, uh, you know, where he announced major sanctions uh, on Russian banks and. Uh, and elites and export controls and, and, and other things. The Secretary General just made, of the UN, just made a, a, a statement um, uh, talking about criticizing the unilateral measures of Russia conflicting with the 
uh, UN charter. We had a, a, a G7 statement today. Um, yeah, we had a general assembly session uh, pre-scheduled uh, yesterday where we heard uh, a lot of uh, uh, voices uh, criticizing uh, what the Russian Federation uh, has done. But um, in terms of what's going to happen next, um, as President, uh, as uh, Ambassador Thomas Greenfield announced last night, today we, in coordination um, uh, with our uh, allies and partners on the Security Council and, and the region, have circulated a, uh, uh, to Council members a resolution on, on Russia in response to their aggression against uh, Ukraine, and we expect um, and are, are, are pushing for a vote as, uh, as soon as possible. I think it's important probably to say for those following uh, UN practices that, of course, we expect Russia to uh, veto. Um, uh, but, you know, in, in so doing so, we think that they'll um, underscore their own isolation. And I don't think we should be abandoning our principles um, and do nothing. It's, an important, it's important that we send a message to Ukraine, to Russia, and to the world that the Security Council won't look away. Uh, it was established precisely for this kind of scenario, a stronger country waging uh, a war against a weaker neighbor in violation of the UN Charter. And so we view the Council as a, a critical uh, venue in which uh, Russia must be forced to uh, um, explain itself. Um, and then we'll, of course, move uh, uh, to the General Assembly uh, in uh, uh, in due course. Our own kind of view is they're not going to veto our voices, as Ambassador Thomas Greenfield said uh, last night, and it's really a first step toward holding Russia uh, accountable for its actions. Well, thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Um, Congressman, uh, you have talked about comprehensive sanctions and about bringing together allies uh, to back Ukraine sovereignty. Tell us more about your take on what's happening in Ukraine um, and the U.S. response. Uh, and the likely response from Congress. I believe you're muted. Congressman, I'm sorry. <laughs> there you well, go. That, that prevents the audience from listening to my dog. I apologize for that. <laughs> I want to say it's a pleasure to be with you, Peter, and the ambassador. And let me start out by saying how much I appreciate Ambassador Thomas Greenfield's firm voice over the last few weeks uh, representing the United States in the outrage of what Russia is planned, has planned, and is carrying out. My regret is fairly simple. I don't believe Russia's ever paid a diplomatic or economic price for their malfeasance in Syria, Crimea, or in Eastern Ukraine over these past few years. And I have to say that as bluntly as I can. And likewise, I wish we'd had a bicameral, bipartisan uh, resolution in uh, for the protection and support of the sovereignty of Ukraine by the Congress even last fall. Uh, we've not even debated that on the uh, House floor yet. And as a part of that, Peter, I think we should add uh, our word on strong, stinging sanctions uh, as well. So in summary, I wish we had sanctioned Russia much more firmly over the years as they broke the UN Charter many times, violated international law many times, not just in the last uh, few weeks. Uh, and likewise, uh, I hope that Congress, when we come back in session next week, can have a bipartisan, bicameral resolution in support of the people of Ukraine, its territorial integrity, and add to uh, our firm views on sanctions. Great, thank you. Um, and this is obviously a topic that is going to continue we're all going to be continuing to deal with, whether in Congress and the executive branch or in the advocacy community. Um, uh, Congressman, if I, if I may, uh, you were uh, one of the two congressional delegates um, uh, to the General Assembly um, uh, beginning in September, um, and you um, traveled to the UN, had a series of meetings while you were there. What issues did you discuss? Um, and, um, you know, how important is it from your perspective that members of Congress go to New York, understand what the UN is doing? Because as we have seen, as Ambassador De Laurentiis has laid out, there's a lot of important steps being taken here in New York, taken in New York related to Ukraine and the other topics of the day. Well, I think uh, members of Congress uh, need to be intimately familiar with uh, our UN mission, 
uh, its efforts on behalf of representing the United States and be familiar with uh, the UN agencies that are working around the world, uh, either in health or in food or in many other ways, including the peacekeeping mission. I think that's an important understanding for members to have. On my November visit, uh, it was very informative. First and foremost, I wanted to talk about uh, the food program. I visited Rome uh, in August, and I wanted to get a perspective on trying to deliver food aid uh, despite the uh, collapse of Afghanistan and turning the country over to the Taliban. So we talked a little bit about uh, the food issues uh, there. Uh, we talked about uh, uh, how the UN works in that environment. That was very informative to me in a in a nation that's in collapse where we don't have a recognized uh, government. We also talked at length about a new peril, I think, that's facing Europe and the Gulf states, which is that uh, Bashar al-Assad, the dictator, a uh, mass murderer in uh, Syria, is now in the drug manufacturing business. So we talked with uh, the appropriate UN personnel about Captagon, which is a, a deeply addictive, damaging methamphetamine being manufactured in Syria and being distributed across the Mediterranean and in the Gulf. Uh, that was an important issue in the UN's uh, uh, mission uh, around drugs and drug interdiction. And finally, Peter, we talked about uh, the democracies and how the democracies can work together uh, in the UN on a collective basis. For example, encouraging more of our citizens to become UN officers uh, in the various UN missions uh, from uh, our own countries, so that we are not, uh, that we are developing future leaders at the UN that come from a democratic background. And finally, on a related subject, how is China using its influence in the UN and UN agencies? And that was a keen topic, and I learned a lot from talking not only to uh, our staff, uh, UN officers, but also representatives of G7 nations in New York. Well, it's an important point about sort of the role of China. And we did, a, as part of our state-by-state -state poll, we, um, you know, found that, you know, the vast majority of American voters uh, <clears throat> understand that American leadership at the United Nations is important to help counter Chinese influence and counter the influence of non-democratic countries and countries that don't share our values. Uh, and so I think it's a um, you know, Ambassador De Laurentiis, maybe if you could tackle that a little bit, um, um, to what extent is U.S. leadership at the U.N. showing up, paying our dues, um, important to ensuring that when the U.S. The U.N. implements programs uh, and decisions are made at the U.N., that um, the U.S. has maximum um, leverage and that we are effectively able to counter countries that don't necessarily, with whom we don't see eye to eye, like China and Russia. Tell me a little bit more about leadership and how that plays out in New York. Right. Well, it's, I mean, it's a good question um, uh, and certainly a very timely one. Uh, I, I, I think showing leadership, being present, uh, being actively engaged, and of course, um, uh, uh, paying our dues are all uh, are all very um, critical. In, in the case of, of sort of China and our, our, our focus on China um, at, at, at the UN, I, you know, we should point out that our activities and engagement at the UN, are, you know, are not necessarily aimed at countering um, China's rise as kind of one of the questions in the series suggests that the international order that we help build and continue to defend today has enabled the rise of some of our fiercest uh, competitors. Um, we, we should maybe reiterate uh, Secretary Blinken's framework for our relationship with China, which is that it'll be competitive when it should be and collaborative when it can be and adversarial when it must be. And this all plays out uh, uh, here. Um, uh, you know, we should then note also um, that the overarching framework for our engagement at the UN is to preserve the integrity of the multilateral system uh, uh, the world came together to build um, in the aftermath uh, uh, of World War II. And, and, and we can then address sort of the other countries part. We, we can say that it's 
all in our interest to ensure that the purposes and principles of the charter are uh, upheld. And when China uh, acts in a way that it's inconsistent with these principles and purposes, such as by defying a legally binding decision of a tribunal um, that its claims in the South China Sea are invalid or by committing uh, uh, gross human rights violations, you know, other, other countries take note. So this, kind, this cuts across regional lines, I, I, I would say, and, and, the, and the U.S. will stand on common ground with any country that upholds its commitments um, to the order we uh, founded uh, together. And I think on that basis, um, uh, we, can, we can challenge uh, 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 China effectively. Great. Thank you very much. Um, you, part of the discussion today that you raised, Congressman, was um, focusing on issues that Americans care about, like the rise of, um, you know, uh, methamphetamines and other types of drugs that are in our communities and what can the UN do? But there's a broad range of issues. Americans are concerned about immigration. They're concerned about uh, drugs in our communities. They're concerned about, you know, our role in the world. How important is it when we think about the UN's work that we try to identify programs and initiatives, including those in the Western hemisphere that actually are on people's minds, are on voters' minds, and try to communicate about the relationship between what the UN is doing and how it actually matters to Americans. Well, you raise a good point, and I think uh, drugs is a, is a key issue. We're, that challenge is not going away. It's gotten worse. We've now interdicted at our southwest border with Mexico enough fentanyl, most of which is manufactured in China, to kill the entire population of the United States seven times over. And that was just in the last fiscal year. And we lost 100,000 Americans to an opioid overdose uh, last year. So these are tragedies that touch all of our American families. And the United Nations is another place to tackle that drug interdiction, a drug response and organization by governments around the world. Uh, so often America tries to deal with it uh, obviously at our border with Mexico, with uh, the challenges we see right before our eyes. But these issues are all complicated. They're all transnational and they all require a much larger support, whether you're talking about anti-money laundering and Bank Secrecy Act enforcement on the economic side or uh, drug interdiction through customs or through the intelligence agencies. And that's why taking these important uh, table issues at home that affect our American families and extend the American influence through the multilateral is important. Uh, and we could talk about many others, including human trafficking and uh, migration as well. But I think drugs strikes home in the American household at this moment, at this time. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Ambassador, um, you have an extensive experience working in Latin America. Um, these issues uh, have been, you've been working on for years. What do you see as the relationship between the issues that are sort of the hot topics in Latin America and the UN's role? Well, we can we can look to the um, Security Council, uh, for example, and and its um, uh, authorization of of a, a UN mission in in Colombia uh, um, uh, related to a, a problem that uh, uh, Colombia has has faced for um, for a long time. And um, I think uh, despite uh, sort of all the work that remains to be done, the peace accords uh, 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 were in, and uh, you know, are a major accomplishment and symbol worldwide. And there's been a, a, a UN mission there that Colombia uh, uh, requested to accompany it as it uh, moved through this process. But the, the, the bottom line, um, you know, despite whatever imperfections is, is, is that thousands of former combatants laid down their weapons to take part in the democratic process. Um, and I think it's fair to say that Colombians have faced far less uh, violence uh, since. And, and the new uh, uh, transitional justice processes foster reconciliation um, while also addressing the rights of victims and including historically excluded um, communities. Uh, uh, we would hope going forward that the, the, the government of Colombia continues to invest in peace building 
in Colombia's uh, 2022 uh, national budget, including funding for the Special Jurisdiction for Peace and the Truth Commission. Um, and we also hope that it prioritizes uh, peace uh, accord mechanisms uh, because we think that regular meetings uh, within these peace accord mechanisms ensure all people affected by the conflict uh, will have a voice and a role in accord um, implementation. And of course, in the past, uh, the, the, the Council, uh, the UN has been involved in the peace processes in, in, El, in El Salvador and Guatemala um, and, and Haiti uh, uh, as well, uh, which is going through a very rough patch um, at the moment. Great, thank you. Um, so we have time for a couple of questions from our audience. So if you have questions, please feel free to put them in there. Congressman, I just wanna let you know that uh, Tina Halbig gives you a shout out for mentioning human trafficking. So uh, uh, this is an issue that is of deep interest to many of our UNA USA members. So yeah. thank you for raising it. Um, uh, there's a general question about, um, uh, a couple of people have raised, uh, Mr. Ambassador, about what's the solution? Um, you know, as we look at Ukraine today, hmm. what what is um, uh, what do you see as likely solutions as a result of the pressure that we be, bring to bear uh, over the next weeks and months and years on Russia? What do you think is a reasonable solution that we can get to? Well, it's a it's a tough question, uh, but but I, look, I, w I would say that um, uh, the steps that we're taking now, both here at the UN and with our um, allies in in Europe and elsewhere, in terms of uh, of a very uh, tough uh, regime of, of sanctions and so forth, um, is obviously to uh, uh, extract a significant cost for them. But but it's it's the first step toward holding uh, uh, Russia. Uh, accountable, and 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 we'll keep at it, uh, uh, and and uh, uh, continue to um, shine a spotlight, and and do everything we can uh, uh, to try and uh, uh, persuade them to uh, uh, to reverse uh, reverse course. But um, we're just at the beginning of this, and and um, uh, we will continue to be uh, focused um, uh, like a laser, if you will. Um, on it, th these are, these are very difficult um, um, issues. Um, uh, but you know, our first uh, uh, our first objective is to get a very strong um, and persuasive showing uh, uh, in, a, in a resolution uh, that will isolate them, and they will understand um, uh, that they uh, uh, don't have very many friends around the world. Great, Congressman. If, if, uh, you talked a lot about um, uh, the perhaps missed opportunities to demonstrate to Russia um, the cost of various interventions internationally, and particularly ones that were counter to U.S. interests uh, and global interests. Um, as you look at what's happening moving forward, do you believe that there will be bipartisan support in Congress for tough new sanctions on Russia um, in order to try to um, bring about a, a resolution of this crisis? I believe there is that possibility, and I believe we could have obtained that weeks ago, yeah. but we were encouraged to not do that. You've heard the line of logic that if Russia was sanctioned severely prior to, quote unquote, an invasion, that somehow that would be no deterrent that they would just go ahead and invade. I never shared that view. I understand it completely from a diplomatic point of view, but I've never shared it because of the previous uh, failed efforts to discipline Russia, whether it's uh, an incursion in Georgia, taking the Crimea without firing a shot, or the continued support of the butchery in Syria. Uh, when you don't pay a diplomatic or economic price, it encourages more bad behavior, and we're seeing that. So my point is that I really do believe there is strong bipartisan support in both uh, sides of the Capitol to su support a uh, uh, significant sanctions that will hopefully draw the line, be supported by our allies in North Asia, like South Korea and Japan, who are watching this very closely 
as well as all of our partners in Europe, whether they're NATO members or not. Thank you, Congressman. Um, uh, Mr. Ambassador, I have a question to you that is posed by the former U.S. Ambassador to the U.N., uh, John Negroponte. Um, is there any effort being mobilized to assist Ukrainian refugees arriving in Poland? Um, and uh, Oh, you're on mute. Congress, uh, Mr. Ambassador, you're on mute. <laughs> I'll get used to this technology one day. Um, and, and you, you know, by the way, I should say, if anyone is uh, uh, looking for a reason why we need the, the UN and multilateral diplomacy, um, we're in front of these machines instead of uh, together because of COVID. And, and uh, between that and climate change, these are two trends. Uh, 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 transnational issues that we're going to have to cope with. There is a, 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 a significant um, uh, uh, ramping up of, of humanitarian um, assistance. We've been talking to the UN uh, for quite a while now to, to, to be ready. And, and we believe uh, 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 they are both OCHA, that I'm sure your audience knows what that is, and, and also the various um, uh, uh, agencies. And the Secretary General, I didn't, I didn't hear his remarks, but he uh, uh, address this in the statement that he made, um, uh, I think, to 45 minutes ago, uh, in terms of what the UN uh, uh, planned to do in terms of wrapping up, uh, ramping up rather assistance. So um, all of these uh, um, elements are are well underway. Great, thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Congressman, um, you talked previously about human trafficking, and one of the questions that we got was about what can we do with the UN and bilaterally to help deal with the causes uh, in Latin America, among other places, that drive people into trafficking? And is there a role for the United Nations, UN agencies, for the U.S. bilaterally to uh, sort of combat trafficking by helping to meet the needs of people, uh, including rule of law, um, before they're trafficked in the first place? Well, it's an important question, and I really appreciate the United Nations and the General Assembly having a special engagement on that topic and revising the resolutions and taking testimony on it in November. Also, in my recent trip to Rome in August, I went to the uh, Pontifical Academy of Sciences at the Vatican. They, too, have just released a, a significant study and a policy on uh, human, human trafficking. What we need to do is make sure we have best practices among our uh, legal uh, operations bilaterally and multilaterally. What's the definition of human trafficking? Get those laws in line, get those sharing of that information in line across borders. But the other thing we must recognize that uh, the majority of human trafficking, just looking at the United States, for example, are American kids being met by someone, meeting someone on the internet and being trafficked that way in our own backyards, in our own neighborhoods, in our own communities. And that's a severe uh, part of human trafficking that I think more Americans need to understand, not just the cross-border aspect of it. Finally, um, secure your border. Secure your border with the right personnel and the right policies uh, because so much of what we see uh, are uh, people... Uh, being transported into the United States by the cartels. They're spending five to ten thousand uh, dollars a person to be trafficked into the United States. That's fueling transnational crime. The cartels, as estimated by the Customs and Border Patrol, CBP, in February alone of last year, they earned four hundred million dollars just in the trafficking business. And finally, of course, we're already working with our partners, our allies to improve economic conditions and humanitarian conditions in countries where there's not enough economic opportunity. But I really appreciate the UN's engagement and those listening today to help spread the word and how we need to affect public policy to stop uh, this tragedy of human trafficking. Well, Congressman French Hill, Con Ambassador Jeff De Laurentiis, we very much appreciate your taking time on this incredibly busy and consequential day to be with us. Uh, and for your leadership, uh, both in New York um, uh, and in Washington. Uh, and, um, uh, and Rachel, back to you. Thanks, Peter. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador De Laurentiis, Representative Hill and Peter Yeo for your discussion on the important role of the, of the U.S. and how it plays uh, in multilateralism and its leadership at the U.N. Okay, so at this time, we're going to take a short break. Um, we have a little under 10 minutes before you can attend another session. Uh, we have two sessions coming up, one in the mobilized track and one in the education track, the educate track at 2.40 p.m. So just as a reminder, um, please visit the Engage Hub. You can try out the speed networking, which I think I'm gonna do right now, or you can test your skills on Kahoot. I will see you in a few minutes.